Are the Bedouins being used as foot soldiers of the Palestinian Authority with intentions to unilaterally establish a Palestinian state? Naomi Khan, a land activist in Israel with Regavim, seems to think so. In this episode, Naomi takes us on a road trip to show us what is happening on the ground. Our story starts off in East Jerusalem overlooking area E1, just 30 to 40 kilometers or about an eight-hour walk to the Jordan River. What you see here is essentially the only open space encircling Jerusalem that is not completely populated by hostile Palestinian Authority controlled territory. So if Israel ever had to defend Jerusalem from the east, it's crucial that this corridor remains under Israeli control and open. It would have to carry supplies and armaments. The Palestinian Authority knows that too and is therefore constantly trying to populate it and build illegally in it in order to create facts on the ground and block Israeli control of this area. What's up, tribe? Today we're going to go on another little field trip about 10 miles into the wild, wild east. That's about 10 miles or 17 kilometers into the desert east of East Jerusalem. Here's the Google map of our destination. This one is the official Israeli government map with an Oslo Accords overlay showing the corridor that is primarily Israeli controlled Area C. A few Palestinian Authority Arab only communities where Jews are not allowed to go are recorded in yellow as Area B. Our guest today is Nomi Khan from Regavim. The website describes itself as a, quote, movement which acts to prevent illegal seizure of state land and to protect the rule of law and clean government matters pertaining to land use policy in the state of Israel. Today we're going to focus on Bedouins, a nomadic and tribal people throughout the Middle East. According to Naomi, the Bedouins have become the football in a political contest between Israel and Palestinian Authority in executing the Fayyad plan, a plan drafted in 2009 by former Palestinian Authority Prime Minister Salam Fayyad to unilaterally move forward and strategically settle the land without seeking Israeli negotiation or consent. Basically, going forward without Israel to create a Palestinian state. So this is Abu Dis. Nomi took us on a detour to the Jewish community of Kedar, where Bedouin communities live in the military corridor just outside the town. We passed by Abu Dis, an area that is run by the Palestinian Authority and where we are not allowed to go. You'll notice all the garbage thrown down the side of the hill because they don't have garbage collection, they don't have sewage, they don't have any municipal services at all. The Palestinian Authority is in charge of all this and essentially does not do anything to improve the lives of the people who live here. But That's crazy. Correct. Notice also, see the shacks? all of those people who are living in shacks on the outside, you'll need to go to the left. To the right, we'll take you inside Abu Dis, okay. where we can't go. Big red signs. This is an area under the control of the Palestinian Authority. Entrance to Israelis is dangerous, and it is dangerous. But I'd like you to notice the license plates of the vehicles going into Abu Dis. They're a mixture of yellow Israeli license plates and green and white Palestinian license plates. So what's the deal? Why are Israelis going in there? Because the sign is actually a lie. The lie, the, the lie is, it says, this road is dangerous for Israelis. You're going to bear left. But what it means is, it's dangerous for Jews. Because the people going into Abu Dis that have yellow license plates, like that one, that one, that one, they're Israeli Arabs. And they can go wherever they want. But it's really Jews. Uh -huh. can't go in there. We have created the Judenrein places on this planet. That wow, have, she didn't right? go there. Um, she went there. That's a Nazi World War II reference that Jews can't go there. Correct. So there's only one place that by law was created in order to be free of Jews and that is the first two-state solution. Jordan, which is Palestine, it was created as the homeland for the Palestinian Arabs and it is illegal for Jews to own land, buy land, or live in Jordan. And that was created by the United Nations. Pretty crazy, right? That is crazy. Okay, we just entered the Jewish community of Kedar. So how do you create a new village, an illegal outpost? Well, really, all you need is one thing, and that's people. And in order to get people there, all you need is water. The Palestinian Authority has created a full network of illegal, quote-unquote, communities all through the E1 region and all over Area C by simply placing tanks of water in places where they wanted people to collect and to stay put. And the people who come there really only need one thing in order to stay in one place, and that's water. 
The people are the Bedouin. These are the most vulnerable people under the jurisdiction of the Palestinian Authority, and they are being used as pawns to create these illegal outposts, all in strategic points on the map. Then what we see here in the valley between Malay Adumim and Kedar is exactly one of these outposts. You see the water tankers, the population collect, the very first permanent structure that is built with EU funding is a school and the rest is history. What you have now is a community and the Israeli government has done nothing to stop it. The Europeans are funding it and the Palestinian Authority is making cynical use of these people to create facts on the ground. So, the European Union provides structures to help the Palestinian Authority populate these areas. What you see here are Bedouin camps. This all relates to the Fayyad plan. In 2009, Salam Fayyad, who was the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority at the time, announced that the way of Oslo was over. There, the negotiations would not bring the Palestinian state that was that they desire. So they were junking the whole thing and they were about to embark on a new phase in the creation of the state of Palestine, which involved unilateral state building. The Fayyad plan made headlines in 2009 when Salam Fayyad, the then Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority, declared his intention to unilaterally build a Palestinian state. The New York Times reports that Palestinian Prime Minister Salam Fayyad unveiled a government program on Tuesday to build the apparatus of a Palestinian state within two years, regardless of progress in the stalled peace negotiations with Israel. Obviously, this is well after 2009, and things did not go as planned. Nevertheless, according to Nomi Khan, the plan is still in progress, regardless of the fact that Fayyad was ousted by Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, and the last democratic elections in both Gaza and the Palestinian territories was in 2006. So, rather than negotiating with Israel, they set out to create facts on the ground, particularly in places that were strategically important, that would enable the Palestinian Authority to control the territory of Area C. Why not areas A and B? Because those were already under Palestinian Authority control. So they set out in 2009 on a systematic uh, program of territorial annexation in area C. What's the best way to do that? The most effective way to do that um, in terms of not risking evacuation or demolition is to make it so that it becomes a humanitarian issue international issue, and that's exactly what they did. So once again, you see these shots. The European Union pays through humanitarian aid to create structures in which Bedouin live. Why Bedouin? Because Bedouin are the most mobile population, the most vulnerable population, the most voiceless population, and they were already in this region of the world didn't have to be transported very far. The Palestinian Prime Minister at the time, Salam Fayyad, launched this plan and announced the Bedouin are the foot soldiers of Palestinian independence. They were, so, the Bedouins were cool with it? They're just like, yeah, that sounds good. good so deal. I'll explain to you why they were cool with it and why they weren't cool with it. And why they're still not cool with it and they still are. It's a, it sounds confusing, but it's, it's actually quite simple. When we get to the next spot, you'll be able to see it in real time. Where are we heading now? We're going towards the Dead Sea. We're going to go to Kfar Adumim. Kfar Adumim, here we come. What are we about to see? We're about to see Khan al Ahmar. Khan al Ahmar is a case that the government has been in court over for 13 years. Um, it is the flagship, the emblem of the entire program set out by Salam Fayyad to take over Area C. It has become an international cause. There's more misinformation than information about it. I'm here to give you some information. So here's one, two, three across the road. In the crease between those hills over there, another one. You can give them numbers as much as you want. There are over 80 of them. Where? All through the territory from here down to the Dead Sea. E1. The whole area is covered in them. As we go back up to Jerusalem, I'll show you another 10, 15. They're all over. You're telling me that none of these people want to live there? Like, they don't get any benefits other than the fact that 
They get like a water tank once in a while. Right. I, I just find that they didn't get the water tank. What benefits would they get? None at all. I, I, I just find that hard to believe. Like, why don't they rebel <laughs> and just say like rebel against who? Against the Palestinian Authority. That's they don't have anything to do with the Palestinian Authority. Bedouin are a different story. Why don't Why don't humanitarian groups worry about these people? There is no other place in the world that the European Union does this. I'm not even talking about does what? the same Bedouin who live here. Half the tribe lives down in the Negev. You know what they get from the European Union? Zero. The same tribes that live here, you know, half the tribe can live in Jordan or in Lebanon. You know how much they get from the European Union? Zero. This is all political. It has nothing to do with humanitarian aid. In 2009, the first structure was built here, under those trees, a school. The school has no running water, no electricity, no sewage, no air conditioning, no playground, no roads, no parking, no teacher's room, nothing. What it is, is old tires and repurposed falafel oil. They created this mud and tire structure, called it a school, it was funded and is still protected by an Italian NGO called Vento de Terra, and the community grew around it. Now, before that school was built, all the children, all the Bedouin children from this entire region had a school, a real school, with playgrounds, classrooms, sewage, electricity, water. Where? In Jericho, right down the road. Eight minute ride. When I was growing up, I traveled a lot further than eight minutes to my school. All these people had schools. Rather than continuing to bust them there, the Palestinian Authority has built schools here, there, there, there. Each one of these has its own school now. And that attracts population. It doesn't serve population. It attracts population. It anchors a village that didn't exist before. What do you mean it attracts population? The Palestinian Authority builds a structure, brings teachers, and puts them in the building. They bus children in from Jericho. They bus children in from as far as the other side of the Dead Sea. They bus them in to fill up the school, and then people say, okay, I'm not gonna be busing anymore. And the European Union provides them with the structure, and they move in. And we've seen this over and over and over again, all through areas under Israeli jurisdiction, crucial strategic points on the map. Who makes the calls that this kid or that kid has to now travel eight minutes from Jericho to go to school in some tent out here. Do you know what these schools are called? They're called resistance schools. That's the name of the school system, right? They are put there in order to resist the Israeli regime. They're there for political reasons. They don't hide it. They're called resistance schools. They're Bedouin who have no voice and no permanent address. That's why the Bedouin are the foot soldiers of Palestinian independence, according to the Bayat plan. Here it is. So why would the Bedouins go along with this? This, this is where the school is. This is where they'll go. This is where their water is being provided. We just saw it outside Abu Dis. There's Abu Dis, the exact same thing. They're still in shacks outside of Abu Dis rather than inside apartments, inside an area ruled by the Palestinian Authority. Because this is political. You will hear in the media, oh, the Arabs, the Jahalin Bedouin of Khan al-Akhmar have been on this spot since the 1950s and Israel is trying to dispossess them. Well, we did what we do everywhere else that Rigobim is active and we actually looked into it. So we looked back at aerial photography. This is what this area looked like in 1967. Nothing. There's no village, there's no people, there's not even any tents, right? There's nothing here. Nothing was here. And that is why this land what you see happening around you are lands that belong within the municipality of Karadumim, the Jewish community up at the top of this hill. And part of the land was actually slated for the expansion of Route 1, which will serve everyone who uses the roadways here, Jews and Arabs alike. But they're squatting there. The Palestinian Authority supports them, keeps them there, forces them actually to stay there against their own best interests. We've been through six rounds of Supreme Court hearings, the Supreme Court of Israel, which cannot by any means be accused of being right wing, uh, has found over and over again that this is an illegal squatters camp and it does not serve the best interests of the people living here, particularly the children, to live in this way. The State of Israel was required and did create an alternative for them. 
just outside Abu Dis, where we just were, on Israeli-owned state land, registered to the state of Israel. They developed all these plots of land. They ran electricity, water, sewage, and said to the Jahalim living here, okay, now you can move. Everything's ready for you. Uh, and the Palestinian Authority and the European Union went to court to block any resolution of this standoff. They went to court and they also arrested the people who live here, the head, the men, brought them to Ramallah and made it very, very clear to them that under threats of violence, serious violence, they were not to come to any agreement with the Israelis. So you have these political outposts all through the area generally along the roads at crucial strategic points and it's not only in E1, it's all through Area C over and over and over again uh, and the Europeans support all of this and threaten Israel with very very serious international ramifications if these illegal camps are removed. That's wild. I would love to just talk to some of these people like just randomly walk in and ask them. You have to get permission from the army or you do? whatever. Yeah. I can't go in there? It's closed military zone. I basically can't go in there and talk to people living there. On a good day, you come out here and you see a whole parade, Palestinian Authority, all kinds of ministers and foreign dignitaries, events and demonstrations and whatever. They blocked all the roads. You can't go in anymore. Again, I've been coming to this spot for four years now, and it's double the size it was four years ago. Instead of getting smaller, it's getting bigger. The people here actually rent blocks from tribes near the Dead Sea so that it looks like it. they call it a herding community. Come on. But they really do, yeah. Come they truck them in, you can see them in, at night. Whatever your politics are regarding one state or two states, from a few hundred yards away, we can only truly know so much. Regardless of motive, these Bedouin camps are numerous and not only create a security threat along a military corridor, but also appear to create a real humanitarian crisis that puts communities and young children in harm's way. And maybe, even at the expense of the European Union. What's up, Tribe? We're committed to intrigue, inspire, and inform by sharing important but untold stories, untold perspectives, and untold worlds. If you would like to help us produce more videos like these, please consider going to tribejournal.org and joining our digital online community. Thank you in advance.